This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. You're listening to episode 15, Taylor Wright. Taylor Wright came into this world on April 23, 1984. We don't know where she was born, but Taylor grew up in sunshiny Florida. Unfortunately, her early life was much darker than the state she lived in. Taylor had a difficult childhood. She left her family at 13, and Florida's Department of Children and Families took her in. They placed Taylor in foster care, and she was lucky enough to be adopted by a loving family by the time she turned 14. Her adopted mother, Nancy Murchison, had a farm three hours outside of Pensacola and introduced Taylor to horseback riding. It was an activity that they enjoyed doing together. Taylor attended the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, which was located on the state's coast. She graduated with a degree in criminal justice. She worked as a police officer for the Jacksonville Police Department in North Carolina. She focused on doing her job to the best of her ability and wanted nothing more than to be considered an excellent cop. Taylor wanted to make a difference in her community by providing protection and catching bad guys. Taylor married a man named Jeff Wright, who was three years her senior and was in the military. The couple had one son, and they named him Drake. Taylor was seemingly satisfied with her life. Besides her love of horses, she loved fishing and working out. Taylor went out for drinks with friends when she was off duty. She wanted to surround herself with people who were positive and happy. In the fall of 2013, Taylor became a contractor for a well-known PI firm. While many people have a romanticized notion of what it's like to be a private investigator, most of the people who are in that field work for insurance companies and investigate workman's comp and disability cases. This was precisely the kind of surveillance work that Taylor performed. In April 2014, the Wright family moved to Florida because of Jeff's orders from the military. After she became a PI, Taylor was more secretive of her work, and one discussed the details of her cases at home. She also owned her own company and was trying to grow that business as well. By the time March 2015 came around, Taylor and Jeff's marriage was not doing well, and the couple had not been getting along. They mutually decided to separate, and Jeff moved out of the family home. On June 16, 2015, Jeff filed for divorce in Okaloosa County, Florida. The divorce was contentious, and even turned physical. One month later, Taylor was arrested in an adjacent county for assaulting Jeff. She posted the $500 bond, but never went to court because Jeff dropped the charges. Jeff felt emotionally abused by Taylor during their marriage. She would say things like she was going to end his career. She even put a GPS tracker on Jeff's car. When the court asked for proof of employment, Taylor failed to provide that documentation. She possessed large sums of unexplained income that she attempted to keep hidden. Jeff stated that, Taylor filed a $24,000 fraudulent insurance claim in his name with the military after they moved to Florida. After a decade of being married, they finalized their divorce on December 30, 2016, and Jeff received full custody of Drake. Father and son had moved away from Taylor and went back to North Carolina. A few months later, in February 2017, their divorce case was reopened. Taylor and Jeff were in and out of court. Taylor was struggling financially, plus she was ordered to pay back child support, besides starting her monthly child support payments to Jeff. When one of their joint accounts was unfrozen, she made several withdrawals that totaled $100,000. Per the court ruling, neither one of them were to touch that money. Jeff and Taylor never reached a point in their post-divorce relationship where they could get along.
Pensacola is a city in Florida's panhandle, with a population of over 50,000. Pensacola has a complicated history for the LGBT community due to its historical conservatism. But it's still a desirable city because of having some of the most beautiful scenery and the whitest beaches. Even though 33-year-old Taylor had financial struggles, she had created a new life for herself in Pensacola, Florida. And in April 2017, started seeing a woman named Cassandra Walter. They had a few difficulties in their relationship, but they decided that Taylor should move into Cassandra's home in the summer of 2017. In August of that year, Taylor asked her friend, Ashley MacArthur, to hold on to a $34,000 cashier's check. With all the court proceedings between her and Jeff, Taylor did not want to deposit the check back into her own account. A few weeks later, Taylor asked Ashley for the cashier's check back. She had an upcoming court date and needed to put that money back in its original account, else she'd be held in contempt of court. Between August 29th through September 7th in 2017, Taylor repeatedly contacted Ashley, but Ashley was evasive about giving her the cashier's check back. On the evening of September 7th, Taylor had dinner with her girlfriend Cassandra. They discussed the trouble Taylor was having with Ashley in trying to get her check back, and that it was being held in Ashley's safe deposit box that she had opened at Wells Fargo. Cassandra and Taylor were on friendly terms with Ashley, They even went on vacation to New Orleans together in August of that year. Taylor did not expect that it would be so difficult to get her money back from her friend. After dinner, Taylor and Ashley made plans for the next day. Ashley would pick up Taylor in the morning from Cassandra's house, and she finally agreed to go to the bank to get Taylor's check. On the morning of September 8th, Cassandra was getting ready to go to her volunteer job. Taylor's calm demeanor turned tense. She seemed stressed as it drew nearer to the time of Ashley's arrival. Ashley arrived at 10 a.m., and both Taylor and Cassandra left the house. After Cassandra said goodbye to Taylor and exchanged pleasantries with Ashley, she left for the day. Cassandra assumed that after she left, Taylor and Ashley ran their errand. Cassandra and Taylor texted back and forth until 11.30 a.m., but all of a sudden, Taylor stopped responding to her text messages. At 4 p.m., Cassandra texted Ashley and asked her to have Taylor call her back. Ashley texted back and told Cassandra that they were 25 miles outside of Pensacola at a farm in Milton, riding horses. Around 7.30 p.m., Cassandra texted Ashley again to let her know that whatever was going on was not okay and to please get in contact with her. Ashley called Cassandra back and told her that they left Milton, and they had gone back to Ashley's house. Ashley said that at 5 p.m., Taylor had called an Uber because she was stressed out and wanted to go have a drink. When Cassandra hung up the phone with Ashley, Taylor texted her a few minutes later, I'll call you later because I need to get my life organized and back on track. Cassandra immediately thought this text message was out of character because Taylor didn't feel like her life was unorganized. She had also never seen Taylor use an Uber for as long as they had been together. Cassandra saw Ashley later that evening, when Ashley stopped by her house for 15 minutes. She brought Taylor's jewelry that was supposedly left in Ashley's car. When Cassandra pressed Ashley about where Taylor went, Ashley repeated her Uber story, adding that Taylor had two brown bags that contained her clothing, papers, and also cash and checks. Later, Cassandra discovered these two brown bags. One had been in Taylor's truck that contained clothing, and the other one was located in Cassandra's third bedroom. Cassandra assumed that after she left her house on the morning of the 8th, Taylor and Ashley left to take care of the bank errand. It was perplexing how the bags made their way back to Cassandra's Berkeley Drive home in Pensacola, Florida, but Taylor hadn't. At midnight, Ashley texted Cassandra a screenshot text from Taylor. It was another out-of-character message. Taylor said that the impending court proceedings and the move were stressing her out. Cassandra knew that Taylor was stressed about having court, but she wasn't stressed about moving into Cassandra's house. September 8th was the last day that Cassandra had any contact with Taylor. On September 9th, 
Taylor's son Drake tried calling his mom. He got a text message response from Taylor, telling him to call her back. On September 10th, Cassandra called law enforcement and informed them that Taylor was missing. According to Cassandra, law enforcement didn't appear to be concerned, since less than 48 hours had elapsed since she last saw Taylor. On the evening of September 14th, 2017, Cassandra officially reported Taylor missing. She was last seen on Friday, September 8th, at Cassandra's house, where most of her belongings lived. Taylor's car, a moving truck she had borrowed, her two laptops, with one logged into her Gmail account, $30,000 worth of jewelry, and $19,000 in cashier's checks were at Cassandra's. Taylor's phone and wallet were missing, since she presumably took them with her to run her bank errand. She was wearing a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops on that day. She also was wearing a few pieces of jewelry, a black string necklace with a bullet charm, a thumb ring, and a bracelet with the scales of justice. Ashley's co-worker, James, came to Cassandra's home several days after Taylor went missing to take back his moving truck. In the late afternoon on September 14th, Cassandra and Ashley went through Taylor's car. They found four knives and two guns. Ashley took pictures of the guns and texted the pictures to Cassandra for her records. Ashley took the guns because she had a safe where she could secure them. It upset Cassandra that she wasn't hearing back from Taylor. She feared that Taylor was breaking her trust again. At the end of July 2017, Taylor and Cassandra had a serious conversation when the pair was at Ashley's home. Taylor confessed that she had an affair with another woman and she was doing drugs. They broke up for a few days but quickly got back together. 42-year-old Ashley MacArthur worked for Pensacola Automatic Amusement, which was her family's business. They rented items like pool tables, jukeboxes, and video game machines to bars, restaurants, and local businesses. Prior to that, Ashley was a crime scene technician for Escambia County Sheriff's Office, but that work only lasted for six months and ended in 2006. Ashley married Zach MacArthur in 2014, and the couple had one teenage daughter. On the date of Taylor's disappearance, Zach wanted to have lunch with his wife. Ashley declined his offer because she was busy. When Zach remembers back to that day, he thought everything seemed normal. But Zach didn't keep close tabs on what his wife had been up to. Ashley added complications to her life when she started an affair with a bar owner who rented equipment from her family's business. Brandon Beatty owned a bar called Sticks Billiards in Pensacola. He was a convicted felon and met Ashley in August 2016 when he opened his business. Their relationship started out professional, but eventually progressed into a sexual one. She would visit his bar every day and started financially helping Brandon. Ashley paid his electric bill and would buy bar provisions from Sam's Club. Some financial help she provided to Brandon was personal. In July, she paid $30,000 for a boat. And in August 2017, she paid $8,000 cash for a motorcycle. Ashley even bought him a cell phone and paid for his monthly bill. Brandon had never met Taylor. But after her disappearance, Ashley said, The girl had run off with her husband's money and was gone. They'll never find that bitch. She's gone. Ashley gave Brandon three guns. But by the time investigators were involved with interviews, Brandon had sold them. Per a request by law enforcement, Brandon could only locate one of the three guns he had sold. Law enforcement naturally focused their attention on Ashley MacArthur, since she had been with Taylor on the day she disappeared. Ashley told investigators that early in August 2017, she added Taylor to her bank's t-shirt business account so Taylor could eventually start selling guns and accessories under their company's banner. But Zach didn't know that Taylor was getting involved as an official business partner. Ashley said that she didn't talk about money with her husband. Investigators suspected that there were likely other pieces of information that Ashley was not freely sharing. She had a total of two interviews with police. Ashley had a dispassionate demeanor when questioned by the detectives, even when they caught her inside of a lie. It appeared to investigators that Ashley had forged Taylor's signature on the $34,000 check. Again, it's 
it's not an issue with me. I just need to know. If you wrote that, that's fine. I just need to know if you wrote it. I didn't, but I mean, it doesn't look like her signature to me either. But Did Zach have written her name on there? I mean, that you can use that account, ever. So I mean, I know that I deposited this. Okay. What happened to this money after you deposited it? Um, a lot of it I used because it was payment for the money that I had been given. Okay. <coughs> In, did, I mean, she knew that you were going to do that with that check? Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and that's fine. That's, that's, why we, that's why we did the account. Police tracked all of Ashley's phone calls on the day of Taylor's disappearance. Phone towers showed that she was at her aunt and uncle's farm on 2201 Britt Road in Catonment, Florida, even though she told investigators they were in Milton. Now, at 1210, you are in here. Mm-hmm. We know that your aunt and uncle and Kyle own the farm there on Britt Road. Right. And it's showing that you're probably near that farm, or if not, at that farm. And you're there when, this is the time when you're telling us that you're probably in Milton or headed towards Milton, because it's 12-10 uh, in the afternoon. We were still on the Beulah side then. Yeah, but if you're at that Tom Thumb, it's going to be covering down here. Not up here. The, okay. Tom, the Tom Thumb is not covered by this tower. Okay. 12-10. 12-22. You're still covering the farm. 1247. 1301. When they asked her what she was doing at the farm, she made a series of excuses why she was there with Taylor. You got here for quite a while. Then you, you, you leave around at least at 1344. Your phone's not communicating with the part of the tower that covers the river. What were y'all doing out there at this farm? So we know y'all were there. We picked up some um, stuff that Taylor had there that we had. What was there? That she had stored. Uh, some kind of lockbox that she had. Why would you not tell us that originally? Because she asked me not to tell anyone ever. That's not going to fly. I gotcha. Okay. Did you text Kyle that day asking who is at home? Mm, that I don't know. Probably not. I mean, he wouldn't. He wouldn't care if I was there. Would you have contacted anyone and asked if anyone else was going to be out there? Mm-hmm. When did Taylor, you and Taylor, take this safe at Lockbox out there? Um, two weeks before. Okay. And who has access to that lockbox? She does. What was that? That, I don't know. And see, I left there, where'd y'all go? Um, probably. Absolutely. You're trying to find closure. No, I have to totally understand. understand. Um. Do you go back out to this farm after y'all leave? To set her box up? I'm asking you, do you go back out to the farm after y'all leave? I don't think so. You don't think so? I mean, I'm sure since that day was not that eventful for us. Mm-hmm. Take the difference. I very, I beg to differ with you there. Was Mr. BD with y'all when y'all went out there? No. He wasn't with y'all? Okay. He's not going to have any towers showing out there. No, I don't know. Okay. So it was just you and her? Mm-hmm. Nobody else? Zach wasn't with you? Mm-hmm. When Ashley said she left the farm, she claimed to not have remembered what she did after. So you leave... Looks like maybe you go back to your house. I don't know where y'all go. This is at the uh, 157. Right. 
When you leave there, that's why it's important. When y'all leave there, where do y'all go? I don't really know. I mean, it was like I said, it wasn't like we were just really kind of riding around. What was going through your mind at that time? Mm-hmm. What do you mean? What were you thinking about? Mm-hmm. 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 No. It's kind of like a regular day. A regular day? I mean, that. If it's so regular. Why would that tell us about this? Even if she didn't want you to tell us about it, we're working in a missing person case where your friend for over a year is missing. I honestly didn't think it was very important to this at all. Why was the rest of the day important, though? I mean, really, that whole day was not. I mean, like, us going to my office and then you I think something happened and you're trying to forget about it, personally. Okay. Um, and, and that's fine. That's fine. Here's the thing. You, you tell us that y'all went out to Milton and Red Horse. Right. Honestly, did that happen? Yes, it did. So, you'll have cell targets. There out should be cell targets in Milton at some point Monday. Not, not when you're having dinner with Zach? No. But after you left Beulah? There should be, I would assume, cell targets out there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not what they told us. Well, I mean, they were just talking Police also tracked Taylor's phone and discovered that the day after her disappearance, her phone was communicating with the same tower as Ashley's phone. All right, so the next morning, her phone, this is the day after she was disappeared. Right. Okay. At 2017, mm-hmm. that's uh, 817, mm-hmm. the first phone call, her phone is communicating with the tower that covers your house. Okay. Not her house, your house. Again. Tower. Right. Same place. 20, 20. All these are incoming calls. They're not outgoing calls. Right. Uh, same tower covering your house. Right. 9 her phone's obviously moving because it's over here off a of nine mile in the interstate somewhere. Mm-hmm. So we're in that area. Okay. Still moving. Uh, 753. Mm-hmm. 1753. So, right, the time goes backwards. You know, it arrives back at your house later on that evening. Right. Your phone and her phone is communicating off the same tower, mm-hmm. eight minutes apart. Why do you have her phone, or why is she with you? She was with me, and I was unaware that I had her phone. How did you get her phone? I don't know what happened to her. I mean, it could have been in the stuff that she had in the meeting school, but... Here's the problem with that. You say you got a text message from her the evening of the 8th saying, hey, I'm okay, I just got to get away and get my head clear. Mm-hmm. That's not possible. So the phone well, was... You have, have her phone. I don't have her phone. Well, at that point, at that time, her text came from her phone to your phone, according to you. Thing. Well, I mean, that's what popped up on my phone. What? I mean, I had a message pop up on my phone. How did her phone end up back in your truck? I don't know. I mean, that's what I mean. I don't know that it ever left. I don't, I mean, I just got her stuff and took it to cash. Well, supposedly she left with her phone because she sent you a text message, is what you're saying. She had two phones. Okay, but the phone that she sent you a text message on is the same phone that that tower pings hitting off of. It may be, but that I have no idea. Where is Taylor at? I don't know. You need to tell us where she's at. I don't know where Taylor is. I don't have a clue. Well, if you were put in a situation where someone pushed you to do something for whatever reason, maybe 
maybe against your will, perhaps in self-defense. If something happened and you're scared, don't be scared. Okay, if something happened, like I said, you're not a bad person. You're, you're not a career criminal. This is a person who's traveled across states to take care of a friend. If something happened, tell us. I don't know where she is. Investigators put it all on the table and let Ashley know that they were executing a search warrant on her aunt and uncle's farm. We, we have a detective talking to Kyle right now. We know you have text Kyle and ask him if he was at that farm on the 8th. Multiple times. We may have. I mean, I don't... Then you withhold that information from us. The person who is trying to help a friend out, who cares for their friends, don't lie to the police when they are looking for them. I didn't think that that was... Tell me what you did to her. I didn't do anything to her. Tell me what Zach did. Somebody harmed her, and she's probably out of that farm. Zach, it was never even around her. Kyle. Kyle's never been around her. Brandon. He's never been around her. Then I leave you. So you're the only one that was with her on this day at this farm that you did not disclose to us. I didn't do anything to her. If she's at that farm, we're going to find her because we're executing a search warrant out there right now. That's fine, but she's not going to be there. Then where is she at? I don't know where she is. Where is her body at? I don't know where she is. She's dead, though. You I know don't that? believe that. I don't Ashley, believe that at all. The thing is, is, we know that you had knowledge that phone was there because a, a text was sent to your phone from that phone. It was, it was in your possession. It was at the same location. So either... Either Taylor was sitting in your bedroom with you, right, texting you, and you somehow didn't know, and then stayed in your car with you and communicated with other individuals the entire next day, all the way out of the way, and went to this wedding and was hiding in your car. There's just, there's no way humanly possible that you didn't have knowledge of the phone. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Hi, everyone. I wanted to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in anxiety, depression, stress, relationships, trauma, grief, or LGBT issues. I work from home and don't often like to leave my house, so I really appreciate that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your own home, via text, chat, phone, or video. So if you've been thinking about getting counseling, there's never been a better time, because Beyond Contempt True Crime listeners will get 10% off their first month with a discount code Beyond Contempt. To get started today, go to betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Fill out the questionnaire to help them determine your needs and get matched with a counselor that you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash beyond contempt. Now, back to the show. On October 19, 2017, law enforcement found Taylor's body buried just off the property line of Ashley's aunt and uncle's farm. They arrested Ashley MacArthur that same day and charged her with murder. They let Ashley out on bond during a hearing in February 2018 while awaiting her trial. The conditions of her bond required her to stay at her mother's home in Gulf Breeze, and she wasn't even required to wear an ankle monitor. In a bold move, Ashley violated the bond agreement and stayed with her husband in Pensacola. Once the neighbors found out that Ashley MacArthur the accused murderer was living on the same street. They claimed that their children were terrified. Even though Ashley was not behind bars, the court system was keeping her occupied. In January 2019, law enforcement arrested her for racketeering, arson, and fraud. Two years prior to Taylor's murder, Ashley had been stealing money from jukeboxes that her family's business rented to local bars. She took money from the machines from Azalea Cocktail Lounge in Seville Quarter. When she was supposed to meet with one of the local businesses to talk about the missing money, a fire conveniently broke out at her family's warehouse. Her 
family had owned Pensacola Automatic Amusement for almost 40 years, and Ashley had ruined her father's reputation that he worked so hard to build. At her trial, she was found guilty of racketeering and organized fraud, but was not guilty of arson. Ashley received a maximum sentence of 35 years in state prison. Her attorney argued that offenders with similar charges received a shorter sentence than she had. Ashley's attorney argued that 22 people wrote letters to the court stating that she was a good mother, daughter, and someone that would never commit the crimes she was convicted of. Larry Johnson was the former owner of Azalea Cocktail Lounge, who Ashley stole money from. He said that Ashley was a world-class con artist and a very dangerous individual. On February 21st, after hearing the arguments from both sides, the judge reduced Ashley's sentence to 84 months, along with three years of probation. On February 21st, after hearing the arguments from both sides, the judge reduced Ashley's sentence to 84 months, along with three years of probation. On August 26, 2019, Ashley MacArthur went on trial for murdering Taylor Wright. Ashley pled not guilty and chose not to testify at her trial. On day one, Jeff Wright, Taylor's ex-husband, testified. He was working for the United States Department of Defense and was living in Alabama. Jeff had lived in North Carolina when Taylor went missing. Taylor and Jeff had been financially entangled because of the court proceedings related to Taylor's withdrawals of $100,000 out of their joint bank account on July 12, 2017, plus all the back child support she owed to Jeff. They had two court dates in September 2017, but Taylor missed both of them. The last time Jeff saw Taylor was on August 13, 2017, when she was dropping Drake off. Taylor had a phone relationship with her son when they were states apart. On September 9th, Drake called Taylor, but she did not answer the phone. He received a text from her asking him to call her back. Jeff immediately thought something was off because they did not have a texting relationship. Jeff was suspicious, so he started to contact Taylor's circle of Pensacola friends to find out what was going on with her. He reached out to Ashley MacArthur through Facebook on October 16, 2017, She said that she had seen Taylor with two backpacks, a significant amount of money, and that Taylor had seemed nervous about the upcoming court date. On day two, Audrey Potts Warner, a bartender at Styx, was called to the stand. She and Ashley spoke almost every day after meeting each other. Ashley was at the bar daily because she was having an affair with the bar's owner, Brandon Beatty. Audrey met Taylor through Ashley in July 2017 at Ashley's house. Audrey and Taylor never hung out together without Ashley. Audrey recounted the evening of September 7th and the day of September 8th. These two days were instrumental in proving that Taylor's murder was not only committed by Ashley, but it was also premeditated. Ashley and Audrey went to Styx on the evening of the 7th, along with another friend, Jessica Wheeler. They were drinking and enjoying themselves, but not excessively. Ashley told Audrey and Jessica that Taylor was annoying, and that she wished she would leave her alone. She said that the world would be a better place without her. Ashley then asked, How much cocaine would it take to kill someone if you could put a drug into her beer? Ashley and Audrey left sticks, and Audrey drove everyone to Babes around 10.30 p.m. Ashley brokered a transaction with a man nicknamed T, who sold her $250 worth of cocaine. They left Babes 15 minutes later, stopped at Whataburger, and ended up back at Styx. Ashley told Audrey that she wanted to put the cocaine in Taylor's beer. Audrey's night ended when she left to visit a friend at Sacred Heart Hospital. On September 8th, Audrey asked Ashley what she did with the cocaine. Ashley told Audrey that she put it in Taylor's beer, but she'd spit it out because it tasted sour. At 11 a.m., Audrey took her dad to Verizon to get him a new cell phone and had a receipt of this transaction that served as proof of her location. She dropped her dad off at home and then went to work at Styx for 2 p.m. Audrey received a call from Ashley on her way into work, and Ashley was short with her and hung up the phone fast. Audrey texted her back and asked her why she was so winded. Ashley claimed to be busy picking up a saddle. Ashley arrived at Styx around 3 p.m. and stayed just for a few minutes. 
Ashley was driving her husband Zach's F-250 truck. Audrey said that Ashley seemed fidgety and in a hurry. She looked tired. Ashley had Zach's truck that day because she said she was doing work on the farm. And Ashley said that she needed to get back to the farm. Audrey learned of Taylor's disappearance from their friend Jessica Wheeler. Audrey asked Ashley if she knew why Taylor was missing. And Ashley would avoid this subject. Taylor's disappearance didn't seem to worry Ashley at all. Jessica Wheeler took the stand on day two. She was also a bartender at Styx and was close friends with Audrey Warner. Jessica saw Ashley MacArthur at Styx Bar daily, and they became friends. Jessica witnessed Ashley paying for things like Brandon's cable and power. She would also buy beer and snacks for the bar when they ran out. Jessica didn't really know Taylor Wright, but heard Ashley talk about her. On September 7th, Jessica was working behind the bar and overheard Ashley and Audrey's conversation. She specifically heard Ashley say, This world would be a better place if Taylor wasn't here. And then heard Ashley continue, I wonder how much cocaine it would take for someone to overdose. Jessica shut down the conversation by telling Ashley to shut up. Alexis Cook was a patron of Sticks Bar and took the stand on day two. She confirmed that Ashley asked how much cocaine it would take to kill somebody and that no one would think twice about her overdosing since she's already done cocaine. She heard Ashley state, I'm too small to hurt somebody. I'll just shoot them. Kyle Britt was Ashley's cousin. He was a full-time college student and had moved back home after transferring colleges. He saw Ashley only a handful of times when he was away at college, but Kyle and Ashley reconnected after he moved back home, and they talked frequently. Ashley would come out to the farm because she kept a horse on their property. Kyle was helping to build a new barn and confirmed that Ashley was not asked to purchase concrete. Kyle was at the Britt Road Farm on September 8th. He arrived there around 9 or 10 a.m. and remained there for the rest of the day. He never once saw Ashley. Kyle left around 11 p.m. On September 9th, Kyle received a text from Ashley around 7 a.m., stating that she was on the farm property. It was abnormal to hear from Ashley so early in the morning. After they visited the horses, he showed her the progress he was making on renovations. She was there for about an hour before she left. Zach MacArthur was Ashley's husband. Zach was unaware of any money transactions between Ashley and Taylor. He didn't know about the bank accounts that Ashley owned. Ashley had always done their finances, and Zach didn't concern himself with financial matters. He used a debit card that Ashley had given him. On the morning of September 8th, Zach and Ashley slept in. Ashley woke up before him and left the house between 9 and 10 a.m. He said that Ashley took his truck to help Taylor finish moving. Zach went to see a friend after Ashley left. He went to lunch by himself at Gulf Coast Seafood. He had wanted Ashley to meet up with him, but she was too busy, so they met up for dinner instead. Zach didn't know what Ashley was up to that day. He assumed that she was working, and her behavior seemed normal to him. Steve Holmes was an officer in the Santa Rosa County for Florida Fish and Wildlife, who assisted with the search for Taylor Wright. She was found four or five hours later, when they noticed some branches piled up against the farm's property line. When Steve moved the branches out of the way, he saw potting soil and concrete. Another officer lifted a piece of the concrete up, which revealed a congregation of maggots. Steve then looked over a few feet and saw a human skull. They immediately stopped touching items and law enforcement taped off the area. Lionel Martinez was an investigator in the Major Crimes Division with the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. He assisted in the October 19th search for Taylor on the farm. He was present when Taylor's remains were found. She was buried under a mound of concrete and potting soil. The detective went to Home Depot, which was 15 minutes down the road from the farmhouse. He obtained the security footage and the receipt from Ashley's purchase. She was seen checking out of Home Depot at 1.07 p.m. on September 9th. Ashley paid for her purchases with cash and threw away the receipt. A Home Depot employee was seen assisting her. On day three of the trial, Home Depot employee Devante Sims testified. On September 9th, 2017, he assisted Ashley with finding concrete. When he saw her in his section of the store, 
He asked her what the concrete was for so he could determine which type of concrete she needed. Ashley wanted a fast-setting type of concrete to make a flower bed. She already had several bags of potting soil in her cart. Devante loaded the concrete into her cart and walked her to the self-checkouts. He then helped her load the bags into the front seat of her Jeep. On day four of the trial, Jennifer Wilkerson, a DNA expert and crime laboratory analyst for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, testified that she didn't have enough DNA from the crime scene to create a profile. They could not test many of the crime scene items until six weeks after Taylor's murder. There was blood on the back of a yellow and gray raincoat from the Britt Road property, and they couldn't verify who the blood belonged to. Dr. Maynard was an experienced medical examiner and forensic pathologist. She performed thousands of autopsies and testified at hundreds of trials. Dr. Maynard performed Taylor Wright's autopsy on October 20, 2017. Taylor's body was partially skeletonized, and she had to be identified from her dental records. The cause of death was a bullet wound to the head, and the manner of death was homicide. The prosecution made certain to show the jury the photos of Taylor's skeletal remains. Dr. Maynard confirmed that the condition of Taylor's body during autopsy was consistent with last being seen alive on September 8, 2017. The defense rested their case on day four of the trial. The prosecution recalled several witnesses to the stand to rehash the cell phone information and showed photos of Ashley holding guns and doing activities like hunting. The prosecution wanted to drive home the point that Ashley was capable of committing this crime. During the closing arguments, the state wanted the jury to understand the interpersonal relationships between all the various witnesses. The jury heard a lot of unflattering information about Taylor, but the prosecution reminded everyone that she was the victim. She was a 33-year-old mother and human being. Ashley MacArthur used a private conversation between Taylor and Cassandra and personal information to lead law enforcement to places where Taylor was not located. Ashley was overly calm in her first interview with police on September 18th. She wasn't forthcoming about the deposits of Taylor's money that she made. Ashley was caught in her pack of lies by the time police had all of her phone and bank records during her second interview on October 19th. Taylor withdrew $100,000 when she wasn't supposed to in July, and then she was gone two months later, after repeatedly trying to get her money back from Ashley. Ashley tried to convince law enforcement that the money was at her house, but that was another lie. The safe deposit box that Ashley said she had placed Taylor's money in did not exist. And instead, Ashley was spending the money on Brandon Beatty, the man she was having an affair with. On September 8th, Ashley picked up Taylor and brought her out to her relative's farm and shot her in the back of her head. She hid Taylor's body until she figured out what to do. The next day, on September 9th, Ashley bought concrete and potting soil, confirmed by Home Depot security cameras. Ashley placed Taylor's body in the woods, right outside of the property line of her aunt and uncle's home. She covered the body with concrete, plotting soil, and some freshly cut branches from the farm. When Ashley went to a wedding on the night of September 9th, Taylor's cell phone pinged towers in Robertsdale, Alabama, the same towers that Ashley's phone pinged when she was attending a wedding there. The prosecutor reminded the jury that the state only needs to prove three things beyond a reasonable doubt. One, that Taylor Wright was dead. Two, that it was caused by the criminal act of the defendant, Ashley MacArthur, and three, that the murder was premeditated. When the defense gave his closing argument, he reiterated that this case had a lot of reasonable doubt. There were no eyewitnesses, and there was no actual forensic evidence linking Ashley to Taylor's murder. Even though Ashley had a motive, it didn't mean that she murdered Taylor. The defense did their best to emphasize that Taylor had a less-than-perfect reputation, the prosecution rebutted the defense's closing argument. The prosecutor emphasized that, just because there were no eyewitnesses, it didn't exonerate Ashley from committing this crime. Ashley took Taylor out to a farm that was 23 acres, ensuring that there would be no eyewitnesses. On August 30th, 2019, the jury found Ashley MacArthur guilty of first-degree murder. The judge sentenced her to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Taylor's last public Facebook post was of her and her son climbing the historic Tree of Life in Audubon Park in New Orleans, Louisiana. 
Taylor said that visiting that tree was one of the best memories she ever made with her son. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. I hope you enjoyed this episode about Taylor Wright, Deputy Chief Timothy Malfitano, who was Taylor's boss when she worked for the Jacksonville, North Carolina Police Department, said that Taylor was very kind and heartfelt, and it was indicative of Taylor's work ethic and love of life. She was a brave and spirited young officer who was a loved and valued member of their law enforcement family. Please visit beyondcontentpodcast.com for links to sources used in this episode. This episode was researched by Becca Klein. Script writing, editing, and all audio production were performed by me. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, We will have one more show for you in 2019, and I'll talk to everyone in two weeks.